Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about an absolutely splendid Finnish composer who many of you might not know and might not have heard. I'm referring to, here he is, Einar Englund. Englund, yes. Englund was absolutely marvelous, and I had something to do sort of with his uh, eventual popularity, which kind of startled me, quite frankly. Uh, let me tell you something about him. His dates are, let's see, 1916 to 1999. He was really a composer of instrumental music. He wrote seven absolutely first-class symphonies, six equally first-class concertos, and a host of other orchestral pieces, some of which we're going to talk about. In the 1950s, he wrote his first two symphonies, um, the second of which is subtitled The Blackbird. Now, I had the opportunity to hear, hear this work and review it for Fanfare Magazine back in the 1980s. And I was, I was very, very impressed by it. I, I think it was one of the, the masterpieces of 20th century symphonic music. And I said so in Fanfare. And apparently that got around because I have read myself quoted in so many booklet notes about England. I mean, it really is startling. And, and I'm not saying that in order, in order to, uh, you know, toot my own horn here. The reason I'm saying it is because it's an indication of just how little known he was and how much how much recognition he had yet to receive that the fact that I said anything made any difference whatsoever in the way in the way he was perceived in Finland or any place else. So he really was sort of an unknown quantity by the 1980s, and there's a reason for that. And it's really a very sad story in its way. You see, England's inspiration was Shostakovich and Stravinsky, and he was one of the first Finnish symphonist to turn away from the sort of romantic nationalist ethos that was dominated by Sibelius, even though Sibelius hadn't written anything since the 1920s, and, and, and Livy Maratoya, and some of these other composers who continued to write in that style, or who were famous for writing in that style. And they exercised a huge and somewhat stifling influence in Finnish music, in the same way, you know, that that Beethoven could be said to have, you know, crushed German symphonism in much of the 19th century and then Mendelssohn afterwards. You know, I mean, when you have a great genius, it's very hard to follow up with it, right? And so, and so England found his own path and his path was a more modernist, albeit tonal, um, style based on, like I said, Shostakovich, Stravinsky, to a certain extent, Bartok. It was in that vein that he started writing symphonies. Well, when the academic symphon uh, serialists, you know, those people, those evil people, you know, the bad guys of 20th century music, the avant-gardists took over in the 1960s, they basically treated England like dirt and his music was not getting played and he was getting criticized for whatever he wrote, so he stopped composing. And it wasn't until the 1970s that he began again um, with the Third Symphony in the early 70s. And then he continued writing for the last 25 years or so of his life. And so his output is not huge, but it's still pretty substantial and it's of supremely high quality. He knew what he could do. He knew his style. And we're going to listen to a bunch of clips, but I just want to take you through the recordings quickly. And then we're going to listen to some things and have a little fun because that's, that's the reason I'm doing these. And fortunately, I, I can play excerpts from a bunch of his pieces. And I really want you to hear them because the music will speak much more eloquently than I can. I can. There is an absolutely wonderful England disc on Naxos, which is right here, where we're going to hear a bunch of clips containing the second symphony, the piano concerto number one, and the fourth symphony, which is subtitled The Nostalgic, which has a movement that's quite amazing. We're going to talk about that. Most of the rest of his music is on Ondine. And here we have symphonies one and two with the Estonian Symphony Orchestra under under Peter Lilje, Lily, 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 I can't even pronounce it, I don't care, L-I-L-J-E, pronounce it yourself. Uh, symphonies three and seven, 
with Ari Rosaline and the Tampere Philharmonic Orchestra, three and seven. Great pieces, wonderful pieces. And this is a great disc. This is Symphony Number no. Four, um, which is also on that Naxos disc. We'll hear a bit of the Fifth Symphony, which is in one movement, sort of like Sibelius's Seventh, kind of like that. And the Great Wall of China incidental music, which we're going to hear a little bit of. So that's terrific. And then we get, let's see, what else have we got here? I got a whole stack of them here. The Cello Concerto and Symphony Number no. 6, which is a choral symphony subtitled Aphorisms. And then, let's see, we'll just run through this. Piano Concertos 1 and 2 with the orchestral work Epinikia. Epinikia, yeah, it's Epinikia. What, I don't remember what an Epinikia is. I don't care. Anyway, it's very nice. And the first Piano Concerto is also on that Naxos disc. We'll hear some of that. And the Clarinet Concerto. Here's an interesting disc, the Clarinet Concerto with Richard Stoltzman and the Deutsche Symphony Orchestra Berlin conducted by Lucas Foss, of all people. Kind of cool, because it has the Lucas Foss Clarinet Concerto on it, too. So, I mean, his music is sort of getting out there, and it's, it's just wonderful stuff. It is absolutely wonderful stuff. So, without further ado, let's listen to some music, shall we? So let's start with the second symphony. It has a subtitle, The Blackbird. The subtitle comes from the, the flute writing um, with which the symphony begins that tends to remind us of bird call type stuff. And here's a little bit. This is the end of the first movement where you can actually hear the characteristic woodwind writing and kind of get a sense of his orchestral palette. Beautiful, isn't it? Evocative, wonderful. It's absolutely terrific. Um, just so you know, that this is the, the Turku Philharmonic under Jorma Panula, you know, the dean of Finnish conducting teachers. Um, and this is, like I said, your, your sort of ultimate, ultimate uh, Anglo and starter disc for the pieces that are on it. And now we turn to the first piano concerto. Now, the first piano concerto really ought to be a repertoire piece throughout the world. I mean, just like, you know, Prokofiev's third or, you know, Bartok's second or one of those pieces, it's in that vein. It's in that style. But it sounds like like, well, like England. It doesn't sound quite like any of those people. It's quite marvelous. Listen to the opening of the finale. just great. The pianist in this, by the way, is, let's see, Nikolaus Sivalov. But here's the point. The point is that England has a sense of humor in his music. Now, how rare is that, right? But one that you can hear and that's intrinsic in the way he writes. And you can hear it, for example, at the very end of the piano concerto, because at the very end of the piano concerto, there's a big romantic cadenza, a pause, and then the big romantic tune comes gushing in just like at the end of like Tchaikovsky's first or Rachmaninoff's second, except the piano's hammering away underneath. It's sort of the chords aren't quite right. You know what I mean? And where you expect the big luscious romantic melody to come in, 
There isn't a melody. There isn't a tune at all. There's just a, a three-note motive, which is sort of the generational, generative, and generational, yeah, I guess that's the right word, the, the motive that generates the melodic material throughout the work. And here it is, but it's only three notes. And, 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 and England plays them every possible way he can. Da, 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 boo, do, 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 all the pianos humming around under these. So it's a huge romantic climax except that it doesn't have the romantic tune attached to it. Anyway, it's wonderful. There's a certain there's a certain dry wit to his music that's that's just just absolutely tremendous. I'm going to play the whole ending of the concerto so you can hear this for yourself. I, I just love this. It's delightful. Here you go. See what I mean? Isn't that great? I mean, I, I really hope you'll listen to the entire work because it's it's absolutely splendid piece of music. And finally, a little bit of the fourth symphony, the nostalgic. Now, England wrote this piece in the mid seventies in memory of a great composer. The two composers he had in mind, of course, were Shostakovich and and uh, Stravinsky, both of whom died um, in the early to mid seventies. But the movement. The symphony has, it's really, it's scored for strings and percussion, and it has this marvelous second movement. It's called Tempus Fugit, Time Flies. And I'm going to play you the end of that movement too. Listen, listen to Time Flying. Go! that just great it's 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 a marvelous scherzo a wonderful wonderful piece and the music is indeed quite quite nostalgic somewhat dark in coloration and unforgettable absolutely unforgettable i mean this is a guy with real substance but i want to wrap up this little talk with a bit of of the incidental music from the great wall of china now this is a satirical, I mean satirical piece of music in a big way. Um, I don't know the original play, obviously, and I don't really care, but the incidental music is wonderful. It has a masquerade in a Chinese garden, the Inquisition, a rumba, the green table tango, the jazz intermezzo, and a final polonaise, but in, it's somewhere in there, as the sixth number, you have a march a la Shostakovich. Yes, and here it is. pretty accurate, isn't it? But the wonderful thing about it is not just that the tune is an obvious crib from the finale of Shostakovich's Ninth Symphony. What's equally marvelous is that quiet little woodwind writing for flute and piccolo at the end of that excerpt. I mean, he really knows his Shostakovich and knows how to create what is obviously a very, very affectionate parody. 
So I strongly recommend that you rush out and start downloading or ordering or doing whatever you got to do to get yourself some Einar Englund. Like I said, there's the Panula disc on Naxos and there are these wonderful, wonderful performances on Ondine by a variety of conductors and orchestras that are splendidly recorded. And, you know, you can collect all, most of the stuff that's available, frankly, in like say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven or eight discs, eight or nine discs. You'll probably have just about all of it that's out there. There are a couple ballets. There's, there's more orchestral music. There's stuff that hasn't been recorded yet. And I hope someone's listening and that they do, because he is a composer of real substance, tremendous musical integrity, great sincerity, often astonishing beauty. And uh, it was a pleasure to be able to recognize his gifts when I first heard them, to later have the pleasure of briefly, very briefly meeting him before he died in 1999. And I hope you will enjoy making his acquaintance because if there was ever a reason to keep on listening, Einar England offers you one. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>